Hello and welcome to Leaflet for Educators Looking to Learn More. Thank you for tuning in to our very first guest episode. Today we have with us Tony Vincent. Go ahead and say hi, Tony. <laughs> hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. <laughs> so Tony is a pioneer in digital learning. He had a classroom website before many classrooms had internet access. I'm pretty sure my, uh, my hometown high school just got internet access this year. In 2005, Tony started one of the first podcasts from an elementary school. He's authored books, produced videos, developed an iPad app, and blogged about learning and technology, and is the creator of Learning in Hand, which I'm very excited to hear about very soon. So, Tony, first of all, I wanted to ask you, not it, this might sound tongue-in-cheek, but it's not. I'm genuinely curious. What's it like to be a pioneer in digital learning? <laughs> well, it's it's actually kind of fun. I love trying new things and presenting it to students even as, hey, this is something that's really never been done. Let's see what we can make of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think even outside of the the digital arena, you know, that's a that's a good approach to have. That's a, that's a good way to it's a good influence to have on your pedagogical approach, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you as well, more specifically, I read about uh, the one-to-one -one classroom with Palm Pilots. I don't know how relevant that is to the work you're doing now, but I was curious just because I didn't know what it was. Yeah, <laughs> so... Uh, are we going way back I, here? I, we, we are going pretty far back, but it, it still has ties to today. Um, I, I like to tell the story first. When, when I first started teaching, my first year of teaching fifth grade was in 1998. And the school did not provide any laptops for teachers or students. There, was no, there were no laptops because they were like thousands of dollars. Um, and right. we just had a couple of computers in the back of the classroom and maybe a little computer lab in the school. But uh, so I maxed out my credit card to get myself a laptop because like, I, I really think I could do a lot as a teacher if I had access to a laptop. And I did. I mean, um, it, you know, accounting for inflation, I'm probably still paying for that laptop. <laughs> but to me, it was worth it for what it empowered me to do. And then it started something like, beautiful. Oh. Yeah, it started something, something beautiful. And then I was like, well, I like having this. I want my students to have technology. And back then, one-to-one -one was not seriously considered because of how expensive computers were. Right. Um, that was never going to happen in, in my school district. And, and then uh, in, in 2001, my school district actually wanted to try a pilot project where they used Palm Pilots. Uh, and those were mostly known as like electronic organizers. There was a stylus that you kind of poked at the screen with. But at the time, they were like $500, which seemed way more affordable than what laptops were. And so I went right into kind of the pioneering spirit with my class. I said, nobody's really had these before. Let's see what we can do. There were apps that could be installed on I've them. I've never heard of um, I took. Oh, you've never heard of a Palm Pilot? Oh, well, you got to fire up Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> and find us okay, before okay. people weren't weren't Come carrying on. around smartphones at this time. So, so it's kind of like the smartphone part without the phone. <laughs> um, so right. yeah, there were there were We've apps all, you could and install, and and then yeah, um, but most people had, even at the time didn't know exactly what they were, and people would say, "Well, what are what do kids need an electronic organizer for?" But when we, we had keyboards that we could attach, they could do their word processing. Uh, one of my favorite apps was an app where they could draw on the screen a series of pictures and then play them in, a, in succession as an animation. They ended up showing math and science concepts that way. That we had a really cool classroom community because we were all in the spirit of being innovators and inventors and figuring out what it meant when each, each of us had our own little computer. So uh, then as time went on, I left the classroom to become my school's tech coach. And then I became uh, self-employed. Uh, I went back to the classroom for this last school year and I had one-to-one -one Chromebooks. And, you know, that's the whole district is one-to-one -one Chromebook that, that I'm in now. Uh, 
Right. Which, you know, if you go back That's to 2001, Tony Vincent, I would have been just floored. Every kid has a laptop. And it's it, it's just neat to see what, you saw what first. can be done when students have that kind of access. Yeah, yeah. You, that, that, that is what it means to be a digital pioneer. You just truly answered the first question there because you saw it first. <laughs> you had this idea of students each with their own computers, even though it wasn't economically feasible at the time. You know, you, you, you had a dream, if that makes sense. Um, what I wanted to ask you, the tech coach position, was that something that had existed in the school previously or did you kind of create that office in the district or in your school? No, that that was there previously. The the school I taught at was originally like had a, had a mission of being a leader in educational technology. So they um, spent their resources to make sure that they had a, a a tech specialist, a tech coach there that was at one school full time. Um, and it just just so happened that the person who had that job before left to become a a principal at a at a school, and I was I was kind of. I guess a little bit ready for a change. So once it opened, I thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll give this a try. And I found I just, I just, I love working with kids and I love working with adults even more. Um, teachers are, you know, they're, they're so appreciative of everything that you show and help them with. They're, they're such reflective people and they deserve all the help they can get. So I was happy to give that to them. Right. In, in terms of your working with kids, you started out in the classroom. At what point did you, uh, what year did you leave for self-employment? And then when did you get back into the classroom? Yeah, I think uh, last year. So I, I uh, was, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I got out of, well, after being the, the, the tech coach, that was 2006. And then all the way until uh, 2018, uh, was exclusively self-employed and is my, I have twins who are entering kindergarten in this last year. So I oh, thought oh, I'll, I'll, uh, go back to school. And I wasn't sure exactly if it was going to be a year or a few years. Um, it was, it was a pretty grueling year because I'm, I really <laughs> kind of burnt myself out trying to do so many things. And, you know, I, I, I had all these tech tools and things that I have shown teachers over the years and I wanted to, I wanted to use it all. Um, but I also found like, I was always called back to the classroom and I, and I, and I always thought, you know, I'm, I meant to work with kids more than adults. And I realized in the last year that again, uh, working with kids are great, but, but working with adults is my, my true calling. So now I'm right. back to self-employment and, um, which means I, I travel and do workshops. I, uh, lead some online workshops as well and speak at conferences and just get to connect with teachers. And when I'm not doing that, I'm trying to make resources for them and just do what I can to, to help educators. I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, you said you had twins going into kindergarten right now. Like, yeah, they just they, finished kindergarten. They, so they're oh, they just finished kindergarten. Okay. They just finished kindergarten, yeah. So is to, is today the first day of school, or is it coming up? No, we kind of we start a little bit later. I think they they have a couple more weeks before it's the first day of school. Um, oh bless! Them. I, I was just up at school today helping one of, <laughs> one of my uh, uh, fifth grade colleagues. Uh, she has she inherited some equipment from my classroom, so I was setting it up for her. <laughs> is it is it hard? Um, being working in education for so long when you go to like meet the teacher conferences and things like that is it hard to not uh let the inner teacher teacher jump out and, and start saying well maybe you should do this this way maybe you, this classroom should be organized that way i was i was always kind of worried about that but now that i've so i taught in my kids uh school i feel like i've had like a backstage pass to to the school and i know all the teachers they were my colleagues for the last year and i can say every single teacher in the building is awesome so i there 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 may be some times where you know particularly when it maybe when it comes to technology or something they'll say hey have you thought about this um but th that never happened in kindergarten and I don't know now that I'll have a little more free time to, to be in the classrooms. I'm actually hoping to kind of help out in the first grade classrooms. Um, you know, if they want to do, do something kind of techie, I'm, I'm there to help them. But 
really, I, I can, I trust every, every teacher in that building to, to make good choices for my kids. That's great. I didn't realize they had been going to the same school that you would, that you were teaching at. Yeah, it was, it was really cute when my, my kindergarten son could read his first little um, book. He came running up to my classroom and got to read it right then and there. And I had even got it on video. It's, it's, that, that's awesome. There were, there were benefits to, to being in the same building. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I, working at the, you know, in early childhood education for the past year, um, I think the, the teachers whose kids attended the school had a very different experience just because the kids were a little bit younger and didn't really want to go to class when it was time for mom to go teach her own class, you know. But I think when the kids are a little bit older, that can, that can definitely be beneficial. Like you said, getting to see your son read his first little book right there, right in that moment. Yeah. Yeah, it was I awesome. wanted to to kind of transition a little bit. Uh, working as a consultant, you travel. This is all information I just pulled from your website. I told you I did my homework, Tony. Um, yeah, you traveled to almost every state: Canada, Australia, England, and the Caribbean to facilitate workshops and to make presentations to K through twelve educators and students. So, with just the traveling aspect in mind, I wanted to ask. What characteristics make schools distinct in their states or countries? What are some surprising similarities, uh, specifically in regard to how technology is used in the classroom and throughout the schools? Yeah, I think the the first thing really is all the similarities are pretty surprising. Uh, the the way that technology is used in the United States is very varied between classroom, between schools, between school districts. And that even outside of the country, that's what I experienced too, is that it's really kind of variable. And there's, there's so many, so many similar similarities that, you know, I, in fact, I'd be hard pressed to think of really any differences that, that I've seen going into other countries in that they have this face the same challenges and they're trying to accomplish the same things as we are in the United States. Do you think that the, um, what makes us oh, say so what, what makes a school different or stand out to me always is just really the, the, the teachers that are there and, and that they're the culture in a building that, you know, they're all there to help each other. Um, that, that always stands out to me when I work with the, with the staff, I can, I it's just need to see all the teachers have great relationships with each other. And you can tell that they have great relationships with their kids. Absolutely. Um, do you, do you think that the availability of, like technological tools like smartphones and laptops kind of plays a role in the, in the similarities in terms of not just the challenges that teachers and students face, but uh, kind of the way that we handle them. Yeah. I mean, we all, we'll have similar tools, you know, Google, Google apps. um, It it really is what so many schools go toward. So uh, having similar platforms everywhere also contributes to that. And then, you know, I've been doing this for so long that I've noticed differences or over time with teachers and how comfortable they are with technology. And I, I used to, back when I first started, have to kind of show teachers how to use email. And that's wow. certainly not anything we need to do anymore because the, the teachers are so much more tech savvy than they were before. Right. Now a teacher has to check his or her email 500 times a day. <laughs> yep. Um, you say, Tony, that you're on a mission to make teachers more awesome. And I love that. I love that phraseology, but I want to know what does that look like? How does that influence your presentations? And what are some important ways that educators today need to grow in their awesomeness? What can we do to improve? Yeah, the, the number one thing to, to be awesome is really to give students as much ownership as possible over you know, the, the learning space, over how they use the technology and when, and then what they're using it for. The, the more choice and voice we can give students the better for everybody the the more buy-in the the better their projects so really really getting into allowing students to have that ownership i think is something that that makes things awesome do you think that Um, i also really oh go ahead 
I was just going to ask uh, how you how, if that if you think that impacts their uh, higher education careers significantly to present uh, to allow them to engage in that way in the classroom to give them that independence and c- kind of personal sovereignty over their over their projects and the uh, opportunity to present and articulate their own ideas. I mean, I, I, it's got to. I mean, it depends on what kind of learning environment they have. <laughs> later it too if they have the same kind of flexibility but i mean i know as an adult here especially as an entrepreneur now i am in charge of my whole day and so i have to make smart choices i have to i have to be able to to be an independent thinker mm-hmm. and i have to have some self management skills to to be able to present what i do but i i also feel like i know what my strengths and weaknesses are pretty well um, and what I enjoy doing and what I don't. And so I try to craft my work around that. And I hope that's something that students can, can learn too, uh, because, you know, the future of work seems like it's going to include a lot more entrepreneurship and needing to be able to regulate yourself and, and invent a lot of your own work. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more with that. And it is not only fascinating, but alarming uh, looking back on times throughout my life in which I was asked to list my strengths and weaknesses and when peers were asked to do the same, it what alarmed me was how difficult it was to do that and the amount of reflection it requires to honestly present strengths that you believe you have and to honestly come to terms with weaknesses that have presented themselves. And then and then what those what those do, how they influence your uh, your potential, you know, the work that you can do and can do well. So I think the the fact that you yeah. would, would not only take that into account yourself, but would encourage um, a learning process that allows students to do the same, to be reflective in that way is, is really neat, really cool. Very awesome. Thanks. You're welcome. I wanted to ask, I saw on your site that you used to um, host a podcast called the Learning in Hand podcast. I don't know how far back that takes us, Um so far, are we are we going in kind of chronological order, or am I bouncing you all over the place throughout your career? Uh, a lot of things overlap, so it's okay, pretty much Great. chronological. But gotcha. yeah. <laughs> so on your podcast, you talked about tips and how tos for using digital tools in teaching. And as as a podcast host, I wanted to ask what led you away from the podcast while continuing to blog and host your online courses. And what are some uh, what are some episodes or lessons from the show that educators could find useful today, or even things that you learned producing the show that educators could find useful today? Oh yeah, so so um, first, do you have a guess of when podcasting was invented? Mm, Two thousand four. Ooh, you got it exact. You got it exact. Nice. In 2005, I started my first podcast about Palm Pilots. And uh, I had a co-host and we did it over Skype because I was in Nebraska. He was in Michigan. And it was like so hard to set up the recording. You know, we set up Zencaster and it's like no no big deal. But then it so was you get like, that warning. <laughs> it was like an hour setup to get. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so we talked about Palm Pilots and we tried to do it. I think we did it about once a month, but which was doable. And we did that for, for a while. And then we kind of went our separate ways. And then I had an audio podcast and it was mostly about iPods, um, before iPods even had like screens before the iPod touch. Um, and so I had some short audio segments there. Then it kind of became a video podcast because what you were doing on iPods and then later iPads really kind of required seeing things. And um, so, so it turned into a video podcast, which takes a lot more time to produce. So I would yes. have a green screen and have things. That, yeah, it was it was too big of a production. And um I found that that just a lot of other people were already podcasting and I don't I felt like they did it in a better way than than I could if I went back to audio podcasting. And then just just the time, the time commitment. I know that you know a, a podcast like yours it really is helpful to have episodes out on a consistent time frame and 
I'm just, I, I just haven't been able to commit to that for, for several years. So I have this really cool way of doing podcasting. And that is I just guest on everybody else's podcast so that I don't have all that work of trying to edit and post and all that. It's right. a lot easier. But you still get to talk about your work and have interesting conversations. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, one of the things yeah. that I love about podcasting, like you'd mentioned the difference in production time between an audio podcast and a video podcast. I've, I, I, I've made some, uh, some educational YouTube videos in the past and it takes so much more time. If I'm doing an audio podcast, I could be just standing in my kitchen. You know, it doesn't matter. It might not put me in the right frame of mind to be standing in my kitchen, but I could be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't. It doesn't matter what you look like. You don't have to worry about the visuals. There, there's a lot to be said for audio. And and uh, there's been several times where I've thought about maybe starting an audio podcast, but uh, again, but I kind of I got to figure out what I'm going to use with my time. And at, at this yes. point, I haven't convinced myself that I need to do it again yet. You've done so many different things throughout your career that I think you work really well as a guest as opposed to a host, unless you had some really specific purpose for the show, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and I, there's a lot of podcasts that, that I get to be a guest on, and I really like that, you know, I think this is brilliant. Like, you get to talk to cool people all the time. Like, you can invite people onto your podcast and and get to have some some cool conversations. So that that is kind of a a benefit if that's the kind of podcast format that that you're going for. Uh, my previous podcast is more scripted. Like I wanted it to. It was I didn't have guests, um, and that that was a lot more work for me. And I figured I had everything I wanted to say, and it would take me forever to to get the outline just for that. Uh, but if I do it again, it'd be like this more casual conversation. So I wouldn't have so much preparation to do for each episode. For sure. I think one of my favorite things about having guests on a show, I, I had a previous podcast that was just, I made it simply so I would have an excuse to talk to interesting people on the internet. That was the only purpose. But yeah. I, I met a horse therapist. I got to speak with a, a, a dream interpreter and all kinds of interesting people who I like whose stories I never would have heard otherwise. I think it's really cool just for that. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm like the, the most boring person out of uh, the different show, options. different show. <laughs> it's fine. This yeah. shows, this shows about teaching you, you work in education <laughs> makes way more sense. My show was about nonsense. So I talked to gotcha. some really weird <laughs> folks. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so we've talked I'm glad we were able to kind of keep it in a chronological order. I was a little bit worried that I was going to be bouncing around, but let's talk about the tools you're creating now. You host multiple online workshops for educators with a new, I, in my notes, I called it a mystery workshop because I wasn't sure how mysterious it actually was, but you said registration is open now. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, the the mysterious new one probably won't happen until like January. I'm still planning right. that one. But what's what's open now is called Classy Graphics, and I think this will be my eighth time offering it. And it is a long backstory about how it got started, but it Let's used to be ready. with Google Classroom. You, yeah, <laughs> in Google Classroom, you could not. You couldn't get a Google Classroom unless you had a G Suite for Education account. And so I go to these conferences and all these teachers are talking about Google Classroom and I couldn't participate. I could because I didn't I only had a personal Google account. I didn't have a school account. So when Google opened up Google Classroom to personal accounts, I'm like, well, now I'm really behind the curve, like because I've never taught with this. And I, I need to teach a class like so I thought, what can I offer people that that would want to come and join my class? That way I could teach them stuff and learn about Google Classroom in at the same time. So I offered a free class. I had like 60 people sign up within like an hour. I had to close the <laughs> close the form down like right away. Where and did you share this? Did you that's just make what it happened. I learned to use on Yeah, I just put it on Twitter. Yeah. And then okay. people were, you know, you say free, they're gonna 
they're going to go crazy for it. But I had such a great group of people and they were people who were willing to, to give feedback and tell me about Google Classroom. And, and I, it worked out a pretty cool format where we got to share things with each other. And we kind of, I, I thought outside the box a little bit with how Google Classroom was designed. You know, it's kind of a way for students to turn documents into the teacher, but I wanted us to be able to share with the whole class. So um, we did that through through class comments and, and it was... It, it was a really neat experience. And then so many people told me, Tony, you should offer this again. And we can see how much time and effort <laughs> this took. You you could charge for it too. So then, ah, well, I'll give that a try. I, right. I'd love to like travel less and do more from home. So uh, I started offering it as, as, a, as a paid workshop, uh, offer it a couple times a year. And usually I have about 100 people sign up each time um, to be part of the workshop. And, uh, and so the one that's registering uh, open for registration here, it starts September 10th. Uh, we, we explore graphic design for teachers, which is a topic that really isn't taught in any kind of undergraduate or graduate school to teachers. They, they teach you a lot of great stuff, but they don't show you how to really make make your documents um, stand out and make them even better and awesome and how to kind of kind of visually tweak them to to look good because so many of the things that teachers create are great but if they just had a just changed a few things about them they really could be awesome I kind of put it this way like you know you you want to learn grammar right so that when you speak, when you communicate, people don't judge you and say, oh, that comma is not supposed to be there, or that capital letter. Well, I'd say that graphic design is kind of like grammar too. It's a piece of our communication and people may be judging you or they may misunderstand your message if it isn't presented in the right way, just as if you don't apply grammar in the right way, your message could get lost. And the teachers who who take uh, the workshop, they like it's the top rated thing I've ever done. There, people will say that they they every day of their life after taking the workshop, they think of something from Classy Graphics because teachers are creating things all the time. I think that's phenomenal, man. I I think that as much as it has to do with presenting the information clearly and communicating it in a way that's appealing, it. Ha- it also has to do with just piquing a student's interest. The last thing you want as an educator is for you to hand out a worksheet or to present something on the screen or to even just to hand out an assignment and a student looks at it and immediately assumes that you are, you know, to put it bluntly, some kind of old fuddy-duddy who doesn't know what he's talking about because this worksheet has word art and comic sans on it and it doesn't look like you put any effort into designing this in a way that's engaging or visually appearing or you know uh, successfully interactive at all yeah exactly and teaching fifth grade this last year, I taught my fifth graders everything that I teach teachers in classy graphics as well. And the, the things that they were able to create were awesome. Uh, they, could, they could whip up a slide in no time and it would look really great because they, they had all these tools and tricks and techniques that, that I had taught them and that they had seen in action. It's such a satisfying process, too. It's so close to creating something with your hands, uh, but the possibilities with graphic design are, are so limitless. You know, the, the, the limitless possibilities make up for the, 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 the lower bandwidth interface of creating something on a screen. You know, you can, you can do so much. You can transform things so radically from uh, what you began with. Yeah, I love I love how you described it as satisfying because that really is what it what it is is that you know, I create something I see my kids or I see my my teachers who are in my class create something and they are it takes some tweaking and it doesn't turn out right at first but especially after some feedback um, and tweaks and time and more tweaks like you come up with something like wow I made that and it looks really great and it 
effectively communicates my message, I can't wait to share it with others. And yeah, that, that is really satisfying. Absolutely. And I think in the, uh, in the academic or intellectual sphere, like it, it's easy to focus on communicating a message clearly, but really hard to bring oneself as an educator or as, uh, or as a higher ed student to focus on presenting it in a way that is, that is interesting and appealing. So I wanted to, I wanted to ask also about your iPad app because I couldn't find much information online about it. And I don't know if we're going backwards again, uh, given the fact that we were just talking about a, you know, a workshop that's coming up in the future. I imagine we'd have to be because time machines don't exist yet. I'm curious what kind of interactive tools <laughs> in general, though, that you've created after years of studying and presenting on digital learning, either inside the context of this app or uh, or in your workshops or for personal use in the classroom or in general. Yeah, so my my app journey started, I think, eight years ago. I had this idea for an app. Um, an iPad app, because there, there seemed to be a lot more iPads in classrooms than Chromebooks at the time. Um, so it, it made a lot of sense. And, when did that change? Uh, this this app, there's, there wasn't anything. Um, that changed probably, probably about five years ago. But yeah, it used to be there were so many iPads, like there were, Apple really got them into classrooms. And when Chromebooks came out, they were kind of a joke at first because they really couldn't do much but that that changed and the price came down and then it really flipped and there's there's a lot more chromebooks out there now um so the the ipad app was uh called stick around and what you could do is like so i had done this activity quite a bit with students is that i would make uh, a diagram say of just a just a body and then for a Spanish teacher, then they can label the body parts and that you, but you want to get the labels in the right positions. So um, stick around, like had some design tools in there. You could bring a slide in and then you brought stickers and you put them to label the pieces. And then you drew around the area where if, as long as that sticker is in that area, that answer key area that you drew, then it would be counted right. So it's kind of like self-checking. So Teachers could make these students, though, that was my favorite part is they're making their own puzzles where the, the stickers are all put in the sticker drawer when you're when you go to play it and you pull them and put put them on the right spot on the canvas. Again, if you're labeling the body in Spanish that you got all those parts in the right spot, then you can click check and it will tell you which ones are right or wrong and you can you can keep trying. So it's great for labeling, matching kind of activities. The stickers could have web links attached to them or extra information could pop out in a drawer. Uh, so it was neat. I loved, I loved working with schools and that, um, but it was, it was tough to find a developer. You know, I, I, and I found one that, uh, that they had another popular app and they were able to kind of build it on, on top of that with, with a lot of the technology. Um, and it didn't, it wasn't like an app where it was tons and tons of, of people downloading it, but it, it was expensive because I had to, to front the money to, to start developing it. And, um, I eventually made, made that money back, which is good, but not much more considering how much time and effort and making tutorial videos and just tons of stuff. But uh, fast forward to really just this last summer, we finally um, took it out of the app store just because if we were to update it, it really would take a lot of lot of programming time. Um, they'd have to hire a, a developer to work exclusively on this. And particularly if we wanted it to work cross-platform, it, it really needed to work on Chromebooks. And that would just be, it would be so much money to, to do that. So so I, I learned like a lot from the experience. Yeah, yeah but, a great learning uh, experience. It was, it was. And I also know that I probably won't ever want to co-develop an app because <laughs> when you're relying on, uh, you know, people and the developers, they were in um, Poland. So we could, we could talk through Skype and stuff and they're really great people. But, you know, when you, 
I know as my, myself, like, like, oh, I just want it, I just want it done this way. Well, I can't, I don't know how to do that programming. So I really have to rely on, on somebody else to, to do it that way. And that's, that's kind of tough for me because one of my strengths is working on my own. And uh, while right. I love working with others, exactly. it's, um, in your uh, career, you had, you had previously with the workshops and everything, you had produced so much hands-on on your own that I can imagine it would be difficult to kind of present an idea and then stand back and, and let someone else create, but also inherently transform it. Yeah. And they had great ideas. I mean, they added some, some cool features to it. They also are realistic and knowing, well, we can't really program it to do that because of this. So that was good. But I also learned that it takes a lot more time to develop than it ever should. Like at the time, my, (laughs) my, my twins were going to, I thought, Oh, the app is going to come out like probably six months before my twins are born. It came out like a year after they were born because it, took so long (laughs) wow well it sounds like it was a really great tool i love that um like you when you gave the example of labeling spanish body parts and you mentioned that a certain body part might have a web link embedded that's where it really goes above and beyond what a, a physical version of the same project can do that and the fact that you don't have to provide the physical materials for each student but the fact that they could pick a body part and then read extensively or do research on you know, that, or um, even just hear the word pronounced for them or spelled out, you know, I think that's where the, exactly. Yeah. So it was more of where it becomes separate from just the physical. Yeah. It was almost like making a, a multimedia project, but it had that kind of puzzle game component that you could include in it too. Um, so I also had a couple of questions. I read some of your blog posts and I wanted to ask just a question about, uh, two of the different posts that I found particularly interesting. Would you be up for that? Yeah. Fantastic. So the first one I read, um, was an emoji education, um, in the ELA space. I think a lot of teachers think of emojis as, uh, shortcuts, preventing students from taking the time to type words out. Um, and, and I've heard some suggest that it results in more spelling errors or a weakened ability to articulate their thoughts and feelings with just plain text. Now, but in your article, you argued that emojis can play a positive role in communication, productivity, creativity, and learning in general. So I wanted you to kind of explain uh, what that looks like and and what led to those conclusions for you. Yeah, well, I I think at a big mental breakthrough when I realized, oh, emojis are pictures you can type. So anywhere you can type, you can put a picture. And there's a lot of power to dual coding. Having text and pictures together, that's powerful. And having pictures is you know, not only cute, but it captures our attention. It helps us remember. So yeah, I know emojis, sometimes they can um, interfere with communication or maybe there are some communication shortcuts, but I don't think they're going away. So teaching, teaching kids how to appropriately use them, you know, when's the right time and, and when's not um, is important. And also like using them creatively as a teacher, there's some awesome ways to use them. Uh, you know, the, the first thing I show teachers about emojis is that you don't have to be on a phone or a tablet to use them. Uh, on a laptop, uh, 
you can or right. a desktop computer there's usually a keyboard shortcut you can use to bring up an emoji keyboard you can copy and paste from a variety of places or get a chrome extension so emojis aren't just exclusively for mobile devices and then it, if you know that then you can bring them in and, and use them in a variety of ways like for me in google classroom i'm in this also goes for like twitter and facebook they they don't give you any way to format text like you can't bold or italicize so you can't really emphasize much in there so what i found out in google classroom and i actually stumbled upon this when i taught that that original class to learn google classroom is i was amazed I'm like what i can't like format the text like all i get is plain text but since emojis are pictures i can type I can use emojis to um, be little icons to symbolize the different topics. Um, this last year in fifth grade, the teaching fifth grade, every assignment had its own emoji. Um, anytime I have like a little bullet point that I present, instead of using just the circle, I change it and I type an emoji, a picture to represent what that bullet point is about. And so it kind of gave particularly my Google Classroom a, a visual makeover. And uh, while I don't have any scientific studies on this, I think my students paid more attention to what's in Google Classroom and understood and remembered it better because of all the little pictures that I include. Well, it sounds like your personal experience using emojis educationally in Google Classroom and in the classroom with your fifth graders it sounds like your experience has been more thorough than some of the actual scientific research that I've reviewed for the podcast in the past. So I commend you for that. <laughs> Thanks. I, well, yeah, and I, personally, I, like, I, just, a... I really like having pictures. <laughs> You're welcome. Right. Tony. Yeah, <laughs> I was, it seemed like the lag got really big there. So I was going to, I am. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I think we're good now. Okay. You can, well, you one can of the other things what about what it was. emojis. <laughs> gotcha. One, one of the things about emojis too is since you can type them anywhere is I use them in my own calendar. So if I use Google Calendar, I put an emoji in there to, to add a picture. In my Chrome bookmarks bar, I often delete the text that's there and just put an emoji because it saves space. I use emojis in my Google Drive as little icons for different folders and files to make it easier to visually scan what's there. I use emojis when I'm giving feedback, uh, particularly in comments, like in a Google document, um, because you know having little smiley faces or arrows and pictures can, uh, I say, kind of take the sting out of some feedback, but also uh, really draw students' attention yeah. in and like, okay, read what I have to say because there's some pictures here and you're probably wondering how the picture relates to what I said. <laughs> Right. And the picture itself is going to be less intimidating than a block of text off to the side that you really don't know what it says yet. And you really are afraid to read it because there's a lot going on in that comment. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I wanted to ask you if you had seen teachers use their bitmojis to create stickers in the classroom yet or to incorporate their bitmoji characters into uh, slideshows in the classroom. I just became familiar with that a couple weeks ago, and I thought that was a really, really neat way to use that as a tool. Oh, yes. Teachers are using bitmojis constantly, all the time, every slide. Yeah, <laughs> it's <laughs> it's happening. Um, and yeah, I stickers po printing them on post-it notes there's all sorts of ways that the bitmojis are, are there everywhere and if you looked at my website you can see i even from when i my first year of teaching 
I hired a cartoonist to draw me because I wanted to have like a cartoon version of myself outside my classroom. So I've kind of always dreamt of being a cartoon. Um, I draw mine in a different way instead of using bitmojis just because I need to be different from everybody else, I guess. But I still use bitmojis too. That's okay. I, I think that it creates a more personalized learning experience. You have the flesh and blood educator, and then you have the, uh, the, the persona who's there to help you and guide you and point at things and tell you what's up when your teacher is not in the room. Yeah, yeah. And there's even actually some research on if you have some eyeballs looking at you, even in just a picture, people act differently. <laughs> so I guess the, the, just have the, uh, the teacher's bitmoji staring at a, at a student all day might affect their behavior. I could see that definitely in general, making it more engaging. I read a thing a while back that talked about uh, children's cereal boxes and how um, cereal box mascots are always on the, sh when they're on the shelf, they're always looking down either to like the bottom left corner or the bottom right corner of the box. And the hope is that children will make eye contact with the mascot and then feel some kind of personal connection with them, remember them from a commercial and then want to buy that box of cereal. So I imagine it's some kind of similar psychological effect where um, as soon as you make eye contact, even with a, a cartoon character, um, you know, your brain recognizes that as, as a person of, or being of some kind that might have something to offer you. Yeah. Wow. I'm going to be on the lookout for cereal boxes now. I want to see this in action. Dude, they're, they're coming for your kids. You better watch out. <laughs> 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 oh, they they already have Captain a variety of cereal that they, door. yeah, it's happened. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't know it had to do with their eyeballs. I, uh, there, I, there was one more article that I wanted to, to ask you about from the blog. It was titled Guiding Peer Feedback with the Feedback Chat. I think some of the some of the best things about a chat platform yeah. is that it allows for multiple conversation threads and instant responses. That's what makes group chats so much fun. Um, what impact has this technology had on feedback in your courses or in your classroom? And what potential does it have to impact student teacher or student student relationships in general? Yeah, well, we in, in my school, we had a big um, PD focus this last year on feedback. And at first, it was a feedback that teachers give their students. And then um, we moved from student to student feedback. And what we found is really that the best feedback is very specific um, and is actionable. And so we, we guided, if you look at the article, you'll see there's, there's, three big questions that we want students to be able to answer after every lesson or activity or project that they're doing. And that's what am I trying to achieve? So that's their goal. How much progress have I made so far? So that's like their success criteria. And then what do I do next? Um, which is kind of a reflective piece, but also getting them to think about, okay, what's the next step in my learning with, with this topic? So we students know those three questions inside and out. They're posted every day. We, we talk about them. So when it was time for me to really focus my students on um, giving each other feedback, I'm like, well, how can I incorporate those three questions, but yet kind of give a, a format or a protocol for giving feedback? Because it's not just saying, oh, okay, this is good, bye, is that I wanted it to be focused on being a, a specific goal and telling them how, what progress they've made and uh, think about what they're doing next. So the feedback chat was a piece of paper. There's also a digital version, but it just guides students. And it's just kind of cute because it looks like a, you know, like a, like a message chat um, where you just say, hi, my name is so-and-so. And the other person says, oh, I, I'm so-and-so. Tell me what you want feedback on. And then the first student will say, oh, well, my, my goal uh, that I want feedback on is, so then they I tell students it's not so important for them to fill out this form. It's really to guide their conversations. But I often had them fill out the piece of paper for accountability. And so I could check and see what they talked about. And then, uh, then the person giving the feedback will follow a, a protocol 
called Tell, Ask, and Give, where they tell some things they liked about whatever they're doing uh, related to the goal, ask some pointed questions that might get the person receiving the feedback to, to do some thinking, and then give some suggestions. And the last part is that after the person has received feedback, That's what great. are they going to do I, about I, it? You know, hopefully that feedback is actionable and, and you know, what, what actions will they take based on that feedback? I think that's great. I think that I couldn't agree more that very specific, very actionable feedback is what students need. They don't just need to be told um, that your writing falls short in this vague way. You failed to articulate this idea. You need to provide specific instruction on how they can improve. And it might seem like you're, you know, holding their hand a, a little too much by doing that. But I think that a proper solution to that is not only to get over it because when you when you help someone specifically through something it will have an impact on how they think through things in the future if you can show them specifically how to do something like you would in a math or a science course anyways it's going to have an influence on their learning processes in the future and they might have an easier time solving the problem on their own but also to have students give each other uh, that very specific feedback and to encourage those kinds of conversations takes away uh, the hand-holding aspect even that some people might have which i think is a misconception anyways, but among the students, it just becomes this lifting up of one another. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and I have stickers that I made that if when they, they come up to me after a feedback session and I'll say, oh, well, was so-and-so kind, specific and helpful? And they say, yeah, then I have a sticker that says, I give feedback that's kind, specific and helpful. Because we don't want feedback to be something that's that's dreaded, that's awful. Feedback is there to help you, to help right. help you get better, to help whatever you're working on be better. And so it's a positive thing. Feedback is is awesome and should be welcomed. Do you have a sticker that says like uh, I call Jimmy's project trash? <laughs> nope, you don't get stickers for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So the, so rather than a negative sticker, there's just an absence of stickers. That's, that's the scenario. No, no. There's just, yeah. Yeah. If you weren't kind, specific and helpful, you don't get a sticker. <laughs> that's a good lesson yeah. for life. If you're not kind, specific and helpful, you don't deserve a sticker. Come on now. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask kind of one one more major question, and, the, and then uh, and then we'll kind of close up. But which classroom technologies are you most excited about today? And I know that's very general, but I just want to hear your opinion as someone who's worked on the technological side of education on the technological frontier for as many years as you have. Yeah, I, I'm always excited about things that allow students to make their own stuff. So um, this last school year, it was just really neat to be able to introduce or to um, reintroduce students to things like Google Slides. And then we used some, uh, an app, an online app called Book Creator. And then we used Wii Video. And that uh, some of them would make a, uh, a one page pamphlet. Some would make like something that looked like an infographic. Some would record an audio podcast. Some would record, make, make a video and that we just have this wide range of tools that are pretty accessible and that I don't have to spend a ton of time teaching my students how to use it. I might I do have to tell them why they'd want to use it and, and in what ways, but then letting them express themselves using the technology that's available. Um, and at the end of fifth grade, I teach at an international baccalaureate school. So fifth grade does uh, exhibition where they really explore a topic that they are passionate about and that they research it. And then based on their research, they find some action to take. And every, every group had some sort of action that involved some sort of technology incorporating something we had learned from several things we learned from the school year and packaging it and, and making a difference in the world uh, getting the message out using the tech that, that we had been using during the school year. 
That's phenomenal, man. I think one one of the main cultural conversations we've been having for the past couple of years is whether on an individual level, whether you consider yourself a creator or a consumer, are you using the vast digital and technological resources at your disposal to create or to just make yourself more comfortable and to, and to enjoy a product that someone else has created? And while I think that that discussion you know, has pros and cons, it's easy to focus too much on that and to start knocking yourself or other people down too far. But I think tools that show people at a young age, show students at a young age that the, the platforms can be used for creation. This is an option. You don't have to create everything. You don't have to have uh, you know, a, a book and a YouTube channel and a podcast and a personal project, but these are options. Yeah. And I, th- I think that that's something that a lot of people are missing out on. Yeah. So really, what, it, tech, we have so many more options than, you know, with the simple Palm Pilots I started with. We uh, have so many things and that it's all web-based. And my, my students this last year had Chromebooks and the things they could create with pretty much a computer that only has a web browser on it is, is says a lot. And because there are so many Chromebooks out there, there are a lot of companies making products and and things that either geared toward education or just geared toward creators that are really great for students well maybe not for all students but for some students they may want to choose to use it right it it wasn't that long ago that cloud-based computers were considered kind of a joke because you couldn't do that much on them but the platform was created and now there there's a web app for just about anything you could possibly want to create Yeah. I mean, the one that really amazes me is Wii Video. Um, it, it's really, it's, it's a little bit pricey to use in the classroom, but that you can really edit a video and do multi-tracks and green screen and overlays and pretty much anything you'd want to do in a video, you can do right there in your web browser. It still just so amazes me. So it's Premiere me. Pro in web app form. Yeah. That's wild, man. We have come a long way from Palm Pilots. I think that you've been a major player in this, Tony. I think that you have been a proponent of technological growth and education. I think you are a digital pioneer. I think we can confirm that claim. I I believe it is truthful. I would like to hear you plug your upcoming course, the course that is available now that has been released eight times and been reviewed very, very well has been, you said, over 100 people signed up last time. I, I I want the people to know what's going on. I want them to know where they can follow you. I want them to know where they can uh, reach out to you personally, if you're cool with that, or where they can find more of your content online. Yeah, well, my home base online is learninginhand.com. That was named back in the Palm Pilot days, because you could hold those in your hand. Uh, learninginhand.com and you'll see a big button there it's register for classy graphics and uh, that starts September 10th and goes for six weeks but uh, I, a lot of educators are so busy that they you know they're like oh I don't know if I can get to everything the course is designed where you can do everything live with us week by week but if you fall behind that's okay you can either catch up or always be behind because I leave everything online so that you can access everything um, and then, uh, on Twitter, my username's Tony Vincent, all one word. And, um, probably my, my favorite place to send people, um, right now is Instagram and Instagram. The username is learning in hand. And once a week I post a, a kind of bite-sized tech tip in a little square graphic. And I've been doing this for a few years now. So I have uh, a few hundred of them. So you can just scroll through that Instagram and, and hopefully you find some cool stuff there right away. I'm following you on Instagram right now, Tony. It just happened. Bam. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I don't have a personal Instagram account. I have an Instagram account where I um, sell peanut butter at the at the farmer's market. So if you get a follow from a... a, a uh, sentient jar of peanut butter. It's me. 
<laughs> okay, that, that sounds intriguing. Thank you, but it is also completely un unrelated. So we can talk about it off the air if you want to, but <laughs> I want to thank you again for coming on. This has been a blast. I've had a lot of fun. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for the contributions you've made to technology and education and for taking the time to talk with me here. Yeah, it's been great to chat with you and uh, reflect on old times and, and current times. So yeah, thanks for the invitation. All right. Hopefully we'll talk again soon. You have a wonderful day. And to all of our guests, thank you for listening and never stop learning.